<clears throat> the passage we just read <clears throat> is the hopeful uh, explanation of the, the redemption that God has for us and he has prepared and planned and made available to people of every passing generation. And while Isaiah chapter 24 is filled with a depiction of God's judgments um, that we can identify through the rest of Scripture, uh, Isaiah would have had a little bit more a difficult of time identifying this as um, what we call the tribulation period. Uh, although the components of God's judgment of sinners and those that opposed his kingdom work and the subsequent salvation <clears throat> that would come through the Messiah uh, would have been clear to him. And so those are the essential ingredients of the tribulation and the millennial kingdom to follow with uh, God's judgment of the world and the nations and individual people and uh, the rule and reign of the Messiah. And so uh, to that extent, this would not have been unusual for the pattern of progressive revelation that began in the Garden of Eden. And so we're entering a four-chapter section now of the book of Isaiah, having finished a, a series of chapters that, dealing with individual judgments of God upon the surrounding nations around uh, Israel that had oppressed them, or in the case of prophetic utterance, nations that will have yet to oppress Israel, like the Babylonians, uh, which Isaiah prophesied their judgment, and that haven't, hadn't even happened yet uh, in Isaiah's day, but just around the corner from Isaiah's day. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word this morning. These things that are written in the Old Testament are written for our edification and our example. And they are so filled with truth that uh, contributes to setting us free from fears, free from the bondage of uh, uh, whatever uh, sin, of uh, ignorance, uh, of misunderstanding, um, and so thank you for these words of truth that you gave to Isaiah the prophet that have been recorded and passed down to us through these many centuries. And I pray that our hearts and minds would be open and receptive to receive this teaching today in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 24 <clears throat> begins with a... Um, introducing this topic of the Lord's uh, day or the day of the Lord. And it's a, a day that is filled with God uh, fulfilling his promises to, uh, to judge sin and uh, not overlook it. At the same time, we'll see in this chapter the opportunity for individuals to um, believe in and receive uh, the Messiah's redemption. And it's such an encouraging part and parcel with Isaiah's message, chapter after chapter after chapter, to see the opportunity for repentance and redemption, at least on an individual basis. And so uh, the day of the Lord starts with global and societal upheavals, verse 1 and verses 3 and 4. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. Verse 3, the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered. 
for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth language, languish. And were it not for that last phrase of verse 4, it would fit uh, almost to a T for the destruction or the, the description, rather, of the world in Genesis chapter 1 that uses many of those same phrases. Um, <clears throat> Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Uh, it's not the same word here in Isaiah for... Um, empty and waste, as is found in Genesis. And so there are some differences, but also these words are reminiscent, and we'll see it even more as we go through uh, some additional verses here uh, of the destruction that God brought about in the Genesis flood, Noah's flood. And so... Uh, the world has seen this kind of uh, destruction and tribulation in the past. It will see it yet again in the future, in the tribulation period. And Jesus describes this period in Matthew chapter 24. For then there will be great tribulation such as not, has not been seen since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The prophet Joel describes this day of the Lord as uh, being near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. And Revelation 16 describes these types of events this way. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. That's pretty big uh, cataclysm that will be happening. Back to the Gospels again in Luke 21, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on your earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It's incredible to put together and piece together these scriptures in a way that uh, forms the, the fabric of the reality of uh, the revelation that God has given concerning these future events. And while every generation has looked for elements and aspects of God's judgment upon the nations, and that has happened, a nation after nation after nation, civilization after civilization. But we have not seen yet the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory in the fulfillment of the ruling and reigning part of these prophecies. And that's, again, an indication that these things have not yet happened, but are yet future to our day. Verses 2 and 5 and 6 describe uh, judgment that God will bring on everyone, including the Jews themselves, for their transgressions. Verse 2, <clears throat> And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. 
in verse 5. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the, the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. The new wine fails the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends, the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. Two uh, points of application, one directly in the context and the flow of it, and one by way of uh, extension and application of the concept. The first red star on your handout, man's sinfulness has ruined, and guess what? Everything. Man's sinfulness has ruined everything. God created, and it was good. Everything that he created was good, and sinfulness has ruined it all. And that's what Isaiah is saying in verses 5 through 9. From the Garden of Eden, we read these words. God said to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. The curse upon the planet itself. And on our words uh, from Romans 5 and 8, which Philip read for us, uh, the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain because of this curse from the ruination caused by man's sin. There's a consequence, additional consequence, that comes for, with every succeeding generation of sinners. And folks, to speed rapidly to ourselves here, there is a continuing consequence that adds to the grief, adds to the pain and suffering for ourselves and to everyone around us into this world when we sin. It continues to compound itself. You, if you've studied finance, uh, you realize the power of compounded interest, right? There can be uh, a great financial reward when you compound interest, and it adds to itself. And, but in a very negative sense, every sin, every transgression that we participate in ourselves compounds this uh, consequence and ruin to ourself. You can't, you can't sin without consequence, even as believers in Christ. And praise God for the teaching of his word that says if we confess our sins as believers in Christ, already saved, but still not in glorified body yet and subject to the flesh and the, the habits of sin and uh, not being filled with the Spirit and walking in the light. All of these things so descriptive for us. Of, uh, but praise God for if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so... To me, it's a big red star of application that sin continues to ruin everything that it touches. And uh, it would behoove us to, uh, to not participate in that willingly and to help others to be uh, freed by the grace of God from the bondage of sin and destruction that it brings. The second application, and this one is not directly per se from our text, although 
just a, a strict reading of the words, you could say that it is, but let me explain. The end of verse 9 says, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. And so I have a couple of sections from the Proverbs here um, by way of application of just that expression itself. Strong drink carries with it bitter consequences and not just in judgment. Now, our verse 9 from Isaiah 24, the context of strong drink being bitter to those in the tribulation period is that it is not going to bring the expected relief from suffering that they would normally expect from strong drink. And one, one of the reasons that I've heard that people drink is to drown their sorrows, right? It, uh, they have heavy burdens on their heart, and when they drink alcohol, uh, that deadens their emotions, and uh, they think it makes it more bearable to go through their sufferings when they drink. But Isaiah's prophecy says that in that day, even strong drink is not going to accomplish what they would hope it would accomplish. Now, by extension here of the application, just like sin has ugly consequences anywhere it exhibits itself, I would put to you the warning and the danger about alcohol and strong drink. If you've ever had anybody in your family or extended family or circles of friends that have been alcoholics, you have seen the ravages of what strong drink can do. And as priests and kings of the Most High God, you know, it's the Proverbs that tells us, well, let's read from chapter 23. Who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? the song of the alcoholic. And every one, every single one, I think this could be statistically proven to be valid. Every single alcoholic began with the first drink. All right? I don't know that any of them, if they had had a picture of the devastation that would have come into their lives and their family members' lives and others in society, even a car wreck by a drunk driver and the devastation that comes as a result of that, would they have chosen to take that first drink if they had seen the bitter consequences that drink would bring into their life? And while we have the freedom to sin and we have the freedom to drink and to choose those kinds of things, you can't choose the consequences for those types of things. And I'm admonishing you and exhorting you, pleading with you to exercise the wisdom of God's word in avoiding alcohol. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 31. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings 
to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of the afflicted, give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. I think those verses give the depiction of, of um, you know, like giving a person morphine, you know, which deadens the extreme pain at the end of life or on the battlefield when there's no hope of any other relief from the extreme suffering. And so um, alcohol in the scriptures itself, that's the application of strong drink to those that are dying or next to drying, dying. Anyway, that was just for free here today. Um, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. Letter C at the bottom of page one. Joy and mirth are replaced by confusion, fear, desolation, and destruction. Verses 10 through 13. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened and the mirth of the land is gone. Mirth is the word for laughter. In the city, desolation is left and the gate is stricken with destruction. When it shall it be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. Isaiah is turning, uh, returning to a theme that we saw back in chapter 17 when he says, In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane. It shall be as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads with his arm in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, like the shaking of of an olive tree, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in its most fruitful branches. That's the lesson and the depiction that God always reserves a remnant of those that are faithful to him, that are believing and trusting him. Even when he brought the first worldwide destruction through uh, the Genesis flood, he found Noah. Noah was the remnant of his generation that God preserved. And uh, every generation, there has always been a remnant. Page two. Those redeemed during the tribulation will praise the Lord. And this is an encouraging part of this dark uh, picture and foreboding picture of judgment that, he's God, that God is going to bring on the world. Verse 14, we read... They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing. For the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth, we have heard songs, glory to the righteous. Yes, um, Charles Ryrie and Pastor David Guzik, I have quotes from their commentaries on it here. And uh, I would agree that during the tribulation judgments, God will still be saving souls during that time. And uh, many of those that come to Christ during the tribulation will die as martyrs, uh, but some will not. And, uh, and those that are alive for the time period that they are alive, will praise God even in the midst of the turbulent judgments of God during the tribulation. And uh, they're going to sing aloud for the majesty of the Lord God of Israel um, himself. Um, it's Jehovah God that is named here, um, which is the covenant name of God given to Abraham to understand his personal name that was entering into covenant 
the Abrahamic covenant. And so I think the question at least partially is answered, where is the United States in end time prophecies? Well, it says uh, the coastlands of the sea. Uh, the United States has some significant coastlands adjacent to seas. And you can find your way from our coast to, uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar, Gibraltar to the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, it's one continuous body of water, if you will. <laughs> and then also the next phrase, from the ends of the earth, we have heard songs. And so certainly every spot on the globe is covered by the expression, the ends of the earth. Praise God that, and it's um, <clears throat> skipped down to the second red star on this page. Praise God that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Simply put, the judgment of the Lord is inescapable. If you escape the fear, you will fall into the pit. If you escape the pit, you will fall into the snare. God's judgment has enough backup plans to catch everyone. The only way to escape the judgment of God is to satisfy it. And the only place God's judgment was ever satisfied was on the cross of Jesus Christ. Very, very well expressed there. Um, now, back to the star application above that. Here are the redeemed of the Lord praising God publicly and out loud, singing his praises during the worst of the judgments of the tribulation. Isn't that a testimony, an example of God's grace? And so whatever extent of uh, sorrow and sufferings that we are sharing in, in our generation, and in our day, uh, I put down by way of application here, oh, that praises to the Lord would loudly ring out around the world New Year's Eve night, right? This is New Year's Eve. And so I say tonight, you know, may his people around the world ushering in this new year do so with the praise of our mighty God on their lips. Hallelujah. And uh, we will be a forerunner to those saints. And we are the inheritors of the heritage of saints before us that have done that. May we fulfill our part in this great redemptive play that the angels are watching very attentively amazed by the redemption of God Almighty in his created human beings. All right. Letter E. Runation, woe, treachery, calamity, and fear will rule this day of judgment during the tribulation. Verses 16b through 18a. But I said, I am ruined, ruined. Woe to me, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Indeed, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherous, treacherously. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth, and it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Unavoidable. Letter F. Here's the return to this uh, terminology that we've read in Genesis. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. Genesis 7 uh, describes the fountains of the great deep 
broken up and the windows of heaven opened with the deluge of water and flooding enough water to flood the surface of the entire planet. In Revelation 16, again, there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as had not occurred. Even with the cataclysm of Genesis flood with the mountain building process that occurred after the flood um, and the division of the continents. You, you can imagine the, the quakes you know, that were connected with both of those kinds of things. And yet this quake during the tribulation will be worse and exceeding any earthquake prior to it. Letter G this is thrilling here for those that are looking for God's vengeance on, the, on evil and wicked. Heavenly and earthly exalted ones will be punished, verses 21 and 22. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones and on earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison after many days. They will be punished. Second Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved... For judgment, I think it's a uh, a reference to an aspect of what Isaiah prophecy says. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians six tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. They are real, they are powerful, they are at work trying to thwart the kingdom of God and his plan of redemption. And, uh, and we must do battle with them. And we do it by taking on the, the helmet, the full helmet of Christ's salvation, the breastplate of his righteousness our belt of truth around us, the shotting of our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking up the shield of faith by which every fiery dart of the wicked one will be extinguished, and taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and with the provision and backing and fulfillment and answers to all prayers and supplications and praises and thanksgivings to our God. Be armed, Christian saint, with the weapons, the spiritual weapons of warfare, and do battle every day with these forces, unseen, but nevertheless, they're at work trying to destroy and dismantle our lives and destroy nations and families and marriages and young people and teenagers and children and even babies in the womb is their agenda of a destruction. And we have to stand in the mighty name of Jesus Christ unto whom all authority in heaven and on earth is given and stand in the name of Jesus and be clad in his provisions for this warfare. And if you're not, you're going to be injured. You're going to be harmed. And the cause of Christ through you is going to be diminished to the degree of not standing firm in the faith of Christ. Well, it ends on a really high note here. Verse 23, the Lord himself will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Now we have to go beyond the tribulation period 
to get to this time period of verse 23, and it's the millennial kingdom of Christ that will, after a thousand years, uh, go into the eternal reign of Christ with the new Jerusalem. And so uh, it's a glorious ending to this chapter of uh, doom and gloom upon the earth. Um, the elders uh, uh, being before the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, God himself uh, reigning in Jerusalem, uh, and his elders there, uh, Revelation describes, uh, I think, uh, what this scene of worship is like. Revelation 4, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 5, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10, thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. O oh, saint, O oh, saints, O oh, the Lord, gather here together today. We don't have to wait for our participation in the millennial kingdom of Christ. We'll be there ruling and reigning with him. And we'll be judging these angels, these fallen ones. That's amazing to think about that. But we don't have to wait. Our lives and our voices and our hearts can be lifted up in praise to him and glory to God in the here and now. Uh, we have that privilege and the opportunity to do it.